I travelled down the South African coastline to find some of the most unique wrecks of ships that have been stranded here, both old and new. It's a journey of discovery, a journey of compassion for those sailors who have paid the ultimate price. I'm Ashley Dowds, and this is my Africa, my home. I dig deep into the past to make sense of the present. I explore the natural environment to find the driving force behind my continent's attraction. But it hides another face, an elusive side filled with excitement and packed with adventure. Driven by the urge to explore and discover, Neisner, a small coastal town, attracts me like a moth to a candle flame. This is where the Paquita rests. So I'm back here to dive with a favorite dive buddy who's taking me to a favorite old haunt called the Paquita. Yes. Now this whole area was um, inhabited by the Europeans in about the 1700s. And this boat was sunk in about, what was it, 17? 1903. 1903. Yes. Okay. Classic, classic story about the Paquita. Uh -huh. She sank in 1903. She's got quite a nice legend around her. Um, apparently she was the first insurance claim that was denied in South Africa. Mm. And there lies the rub. Uh, yeah, she came through that rough, 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 rough head. Yep. And then yeah, in the quiet, still area, she sank. There was nobody on board, nobody died. Um, all the crew were apparently paid off and they were going, hmm. Something's That's not right interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so she's very famous. Apparently when you study insurance or whatever, you'll pick up her story. Yeah. There's a beautiful map of the Paquita. It tells you basically how it's lying. The maximum depth of the channel is 16 meters. The shallow water in which the Paquita rests is deceiving with powerful tidal currents that rush in and out of the estuary, posing a dire threat to unprepared what divers. Thing? You see now we're in a bit of a lull. Plan your dive and dive your plan, as they say. See the current moving over there. Yes, yeah, you can see it nice and strong because now it's basically it was low tide and it's just turned and all that beautiful crystal clean water is coming in from the deep sea. And um, the Paquita basically lies, as you saw in that map, here's that lighthouse. And it lies, it's basically its stern section is it's all broken, but its stern section is from about that area and it stretches to the bow. The bow is very, very shallow. The bow is almost three meters. Just around the corner from the Paquita's final resting place, a protected beach allows for easy access, followed by a short 50 meter swim to get to the wreck. As we float weightlessly along the ocean's floor, she appears out of nowhere. Her outlines now softened by corals that have covered her steel body over the past century. And yet she's retained her majestic aura. The Paquita may have died more than a hundred years ago, but she sustains an astonishing diversity of life. Too soon, the tidal current picks up and our dive comes to an end. The water this time of the year is fantastic. I think so much better than the last time. I yes. mean, we, we had hoodies and everything on the last time. Absolutely. And um, this time it was almost the same as, as diving down south yes. in the Indian Ocean. And unfortunately, we had less visibility that we were hoping for. Absolutely. We were hoping for about eight meters, we got about three meters. More than 3,000 ships share the fate of the Paquita, and over the past 500 years, the South African Western Cape weather has earned a reputation for being a merciless destroyer of ocean-going vessels. Exploration started in 1487, when Bartholomew Diaz is hit hard by storms off the Namibian coast. His flotilla of small ships is tossed around like corks on the turbulent sea. But safety is around the corner. They survive, and Diaz and his crew plant a pedrao, or cross, to thank God for the mercy that was bestowed on them, of which a replica to this day still casts its shadow over Luderitz Bay. In 1488, Diaz sails past Cape Point and establishes the trade route between Europe and the Far East. In years to come, thousands of ships sail the treacherous seas. Many disappear along the way. The Cape of Good Hope became known as the Cape of Storms, 
and I find yet another victim at a small town. Ah, uh, you see, here's another tragedy. Apparently this happened yesterday. These guys were coming in and possibly the wind changed. The anchor started dragging and they've lost this beautiful yacht. So it's even happening now. If you look at a map of shipwrecks, you'll see that every 1.3 kilometers has a wreck. So it's happening constantly. And people are battling with this Cape of Storms. I find it sad to see such a majestic vessel maimed and wounded beyond repair. In time, she'll disappear into obscurity. But 20 kilometers from here, many of the wrecked ships of the southern tip of Africa are kept alive in the minds and hearts of people. You know, when you think about 3,000 ships being wrecked on this coastline, a critical coastline it was because it was a prime route for trade to the east. It really rumbles the bones of story for an adventurous spirit. And you can hear the ghosts whispering their words right here, 40 k's from the southern tip of Africa, a gullis. This is the Bredarsdorp Shipwreck Museum. Marius, when did this whole thing begin? The idea of having a museum for shipwrecks? Uh, well, the idea started in the late 1960s when uh, a woman called uh, Valerie Leight, uh, she was one of the local historians in town, uh, wanted to start a museum. So she then decided to start the Cypric Museum. That's why we have the Cypric Museum here today for almost about 40 years now. I relive my childhood dreams of becoming a sailor with a sword strapped to my waist as I get lost in the stories of men and their ship's cargoes. Scarce spices that were often more valuable than precious metals and stones have disappeared, but beckoning me like a moth to a candle are several gold coins that were salvaged by fortune hunters, many who have spent personal wealth while searching for even bigger treasures. This is very interesting for me because it was all about navigation. One of the reasons why they got shipwrecked was because longitude wasn't quite determined yet. They didn't have a chronometer on board, and so what they did was they used these dead weights. And here's an example of a dead weight that was found in 1653, another one in 1743. And they used to determine how deep the water was, so how many fathoms this dead weight would go down and therefore how far they were away from the coastline. So you guys have two or three big exhibitions here in the museum? Yeah, we do have like the, the, one of the main attractions in this part of the museum. One of them is the, the Nikuba that went down in 1783. The mm. um, reason for this one being famous is because of the, the Swedish plate money, right. which was on board. One face on the photograph of the salvage team appears quite familiar. Maybe a bit younger, but unmistakably a person I've met before. It was Louis Grunewald and Jimmy Herbert who recovered a shipload full of old copper coins from the wreck of the Nicobar, along with Wilfred Schivel. So, I've spoken to Wilfred Schivel, who's agreed to meet me now, to tell me the adventurous story of finding the Nicobar. Wilfred, we were at the um, Shipwreck Museum and I, I saw a picture of you right next to the Nicobar feature. I was looking... There. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I didn't recognize yeah, you. Yes, I was looking a little bit different then. Because <laughs> you were here. <laughs> yeah, yes. Tell me a little bit about that experience. How did you come across the wreck? A friend and myself were spearfishing off um, Quinn Point. We started off in the deeper water and then we went shallow into the, into the kelp. And I was lying over the boat with my goggles um, just looking into the water, crystal clear, beautiful day. And I noticed a piece of steel and um, I quickly dived down and I looked at it and I, we thought it was the keel, the keel strip of a, of a normal little boat. Well, it wasn't a normal little boat. Wilfred and his friends found the Nicobar that sunk on the 11th of June, 1783. The three guys salvaged these magnificent copper plate money coins from the wreck.
The Western Cape's shipwreck hotspot, however, lies further west, where the Cape Peninsula disturbs two opposing sea currents. Weather conditions become unpredictable, and unexpected storms have sent many vessels to the bottom of the sea. This is where I hope to find a wreck, but there are literally hundreds scattered around the Cape headland, and a little bit of research may point me in the right direction. While I'm in the area, I thought I'd visit the Hout Bay Museum, which documents some of the early history, the early peoples, the natural history, and something I'm particularly interested in, the SS Maori. This is where history comes alive. You see the personal notations by people who have found grave sites or they've actually been at the salvaging sites. Here's another file. The negative of the wreck of the Maori. Now we're getting close. Let's see what that looks like. <laughs> I've got to make a poster of that. Here's the Maori here, and that's Dacre Point. I'm transported back in time to an era of heroism and bravery that was part of the adventure of exploring uncharted oceans. But I'm also gutted by the raw horror that's locked up in page upon page of the historical archives of tragic events. The true ghastliness of the fate of the SS Maori simmers off the pages. Midnight, August 1909. The ship leaves the harbour, heading towards New Zealand with a, a full cargo. Then we're talking about 5,000 tonnes in the hold, and they hit a rock and they run aground. The crew of about 53 men. Alarm is raised, and rescuers trek over the towering mountain with ropes to save the unfortunate sailors. They manage to get a lifeline to the ship. And here you can see the rope but it kind of got stuck in the rocks, and that was one of the tragedies. Let's see if there's a picture here somewhere. Here's the poor guy, one of the crew members, Patridge, who was uh, hanging onto the rope when it got stuck. And you can see the pounding surf around him. He couldn't hang on for much longer, and he, he had a watery death just between almost being saved and the shipwreck behind him. The sad tales. A crowd gathered on the remote shore to will the men of the Maori to reach land safely. But sadly, only 21 of the crew of 55 made it. Old photographs show survivors, men with hollow eyes who have gone through hell, guilt-ridden for being alive while their friends and comrades have paid the ultimate price. How does one ever process such a horrible experience? While wandering through the museum, I'm split between the lure of the rich history that's treasured here, while my mind is feverishly trying to find a way to get to the final resting place of the Maori. Many share her fate. I think wreck fever has hit me. I think I'm hooked. This is the story of able seaman Just Nuisance, who was part of the South African Navy in 1939. It's going to take me on a bit of a dogleg, can you say? My story of shipwrecks. After his enlistment as a seaman, Just Nuisance went from strength to strength. He enjoyed all the benefits of his fellow sailors, including a free pass to travel by train, something he loved to do. The story of Just Nuisance probably subconsciously led me to this restaurant. I'm glad I did because it serves a mean fish and chips. But it also makes me think of another salty old sea dog. I met a couple of months ago. Tony Lindekew is an early generation dive instructor and dive master with an impeccable reputation. And I'm glad that I've picked him as my mentor and initiator to the quirks of the cold Atlantic Ocean. In fact, we shared a few excellent experiences underwater. Tony also suggested that I explore a shipwreck only a few meters from the shore, the Clan Stewart. We only know that the ship was coming around this coastline to transport coal, and it couldn't get good purchase with its anchor. And so it sunk off here. They tried to bring it back to the surface after about four months, unsuccessfully, and there it stands. November 1914 it sank, and divers are still going down to have a look. 
but it is wishful thinking to dive in these conditions. The wind is pumping and churns up sediment that drops visibility to less than a meter. Small boats won't leave the harbor, and even though the clan steward is an easy swim from the beach, a shore entry is out of the question, as several great white sharks are doing the rounds in False Bay. The narrow stretch between the wreck and the land is a well-known route where these predators patrol. So it's off to Tony to get some first-hand information about how to find a wreck that would satisfy my sense of adventure. You go to the Atlantic. So Tony has a treasure chest full of maps. So, Tony, are these maps all the same? No, they, well, yes, essentially they're all the same area. They're just different scales. So this one, for example, covers the entire bay. Uh, this one covers the entire bay plus the, the Atlantic seaboard. So it depends on what you what you want to see. Okay, so Another map with some very prominent markings catches my attention. So these are the wrecks that you are concerned with in particular? Yes, these are the wrecks that we dive the most. Yeah. Um, well, the ones that are more popular and such. There, there are a lot of wrecks we can't dive. Um, as recreational them, divers, you say? As recreational divers. Some of them due to depth, and some of them, for example, those on the shore around Robben Island, there's a one nautical mile exclusion, so you can't dive them. I get the when feeling that Tony knows much more about treasures buried under tens of meters of water than what he wants to admit. Is the salty sea dog hiding something from me? If I find something, I'm going to tell you about it. Why not? I want to dive it first. <laughs> but you will, because I'm, I'm going to be on your boat. So. <laughs> no, but if we went diving and found a galleon out there full of gold coins, I mean, we, we might be foolish enough to say we found a galleon in False Bay, but we probably wouldn't we'd say we found it near Table Mountain, just to make people go and look somewhere completely different. It's in the nature of the game, you know. But there's one ship that keeps on popping up in my mind, and I cannot wait to steer the conversation into the direction of this vessel. Tony, you say there's a possibility of diving on the SS Maori. Why is this particularly uh, convenient as a shipwreck? Well, it's a nice wreck because it is in a sheltered bay from a southeast wind. It is also in an area where it goes from six meters to 22, 23 meters. So novice divers who want to do their first wreck dive can start on a, on a shipwreck in six or eight meters of water. Pout Bay is fairly well protected against the swinging moods of the Atlantic Ocean. And this has become one of the most popular small craft harbors on the Cape Peninsula. It is also conveniently close to Daker Point with the SS Maori sunk. Seals also favor this bay, safe from marauding great white sharks that rarely enter the harbor. One large bull has a piece of plastic wrapped around his neck, and Tony can hardly hide his frustration with this. Well, there's a couple of tools like the guys use for whale disentanglement. It's a pole with a knife on it that, that can't actually stab or hurt the animal if you, if you miss. But it gets in behind whatever's around their neck, usually plastic, and it slices it as they're trying to escape. A simple solution for a complex problem. The ride from the harbor to Daker Point takes approximately half an hour. We have to be careful, as several large submerged rocks may see us facing the same fate as the SS Maori. A massive barge that sits on the rocks is another testimony as to why this area has been called the Cape of Storms. Okay, so remember, dive time, 50 minutes. Right. Low on air, 50 bar. Okay. You tell your buddy you're coming to the surface. When you get to the surface, hand up and look for the boat. And it's always something new to see on the way down. Cool. Um, remember, go down nice and slowly. Equal eyes all the way to the bottom. Stay with your buddy. We're extremely fortunate to have found a window during which we can dive on the Maori. All good? All good. One. Two, three, go! Shoals of fish greet us on the way down, while kelp forests sway eerily in the water. After 115 years, algae has softened the outlines of the ship, and if we didn't know that she was there, 
We would have swum right over her without even being aware of her presence. The first clear indication that this is a man-made structure is a needle-sharp pinnacle that must have been a support of some kind. But then Mark, my dive buddy, leads me to the cargo that lies scattered over the old deck. Her load of steel pipes is still clearly discernible. South African rock lobsters take full advantage of all the hiding places that are offered by the Maori. At the surface, Tony cannot let his guard down for a minute, where even the mild swell will crush the glass fiber hull effortlessly on the rocks. But a pod of agile spinner dolphins don't share his concerns as they watch Mark and I curiously from the surface. You can dive here quite a lot in summer, very little in winter. So it's sheltered from the summer winds, which is the southeast. So you can come and dive here. The water's often clean and it's calmer in here. Today the vis is really poor, so probably five meters. We've had a big swell earlier in the week and that usually affects the visibility quite negatively here. I was told that every now and then visibility can exceed all expectations, during which time almost every scuba diver in Cape Town booked themselves off for the day to enjoy the Western Cape waters at their best. I still have to see this. The soothing drift of kelp and fish that ride the slight current caused by the swell at the top makes one almost forget that this is the graveyard of tens of sailors that paid the ultimate price for a life at sea. And yet it has retained some of its eerie nature as the SS Maori only shows ghostly outlines with swaying algae fingers signaling a warning to everyone never to underestimate the power of the cold Atlantic Ocean. The big barge beckons and we swim towards it where it's stuck indefinitely on the granite boulders. The bus was a, a barge that was being towed past the Cape, being delivered. It was a state-of-the-art barge, had a helipad, full medical facility and a whole host of other, uh, other things. The tow chain's broke and it landed up on the rocks here. Uh, it's broken now into three parts. Two of them are down below the surface already. And we all wait every year for the winter storms to knock off the last part there to make it interesting to dive. The submerged parts of the Boss 400 have been fully covered by algae over the past 20 years. What I find amazing here is that the skittish rock lobsters that usually hide in crevices are actually riding on kelp leaves. The Boss has never been in service and she was wrecked before she could perform any duty. What a waste. Air running low, our dive is over and I can now tick off visits to two wrecks. Well, it wasn't exactly the Titanic, but there's something significant about diving down to the wreck of a place where there was some drama and some, some tragedy. You get a sense of something quite significant when you drop down towards a wreck. Beneath the waves is the true dramatic testimony of centuries of man's battle against the oceans, one the human race will never win. What I've learned over the past few weeks is that the swirling waters that wash the southern tip of Africa are an untamable force, one that deserves our respect. As so many that went down with their mighty ships may have attested, the oceans are the epitome of the raw forces that shaped our world and us. <laughs>